Thank you so much for tuning into the show and welcome to season two of the Audiobook Club with John York. The Audiobook Club, partnered with Pro Audio Voices, celebrates audiobooks, the amazing people and teams who make them happen, as well as the various talents behind storytelling. To learn more about Amplify and other opportunities to grow your sales, platform and audience, head over to ProAudioVoices.com and listen out for a short but informational advertisement within this episode. Let's start the show. Hello and welcome to the Audiobook Club. In this week's episode, we're so lucky to be joined by audiobook narrator and prepper Finlay Stevenson. Finlay, it's so lovely to have you join us on the show. How are you today? I'm well, thank you so much for having me. Oh, thank you for coming on and taking the time. I really do appreciate it. Um, as is tradition on this show, I'd love to start by asking you how you first began your journey in this crazy world of audiobooks. Sure. Well, I think like a lot of people, the pandemic happened and, you know, actors couldn't go into theaters anymore or on sets and stuff like that. And so it happened probably for me around June of 2020, I think. And I actually had been wanting to get into audiobook narration for a, a while before that. I mean, like probably 10 years ago, I started thinking about it. Um, and at that time, I was told by some people on both sides that the like the theater world and the audiobook world or the I'm doing air quotes actor world and the narrator world didn't like to play well together uh, which is hilarious to me now because I've never found a more inclusive community than with audiobooks but because I was hearing that so often at that time I didn't really pursue it and so when the pandemic happened and I was working from home I just had a lot more time and I cannot remember how I saw like a little Facebook something come up. I think it was for Elise Arsenault's great audiobook adventure. Um, and I just had the time to do it. So I thought, why not do it? Uh, and so I participated in that course, which is great. And that's how I started really. I mean, my favorite, I'm, I'm trained as a theater actor and my favorite part of every play production is always the first week where you sit at the table and read through and kind of do your homework, you know, uh, and get to know everybody. And so narration is basically that, right? Except I get to play all the parts. Um, so it's a really nice fit for me. And then as a prepper, I really wanted to get out of my nine to five day job. And so while I was trying to get started with narration, I thought I'll try to replace the nine to five and like supplement that narrator income doing prep work. And that just kind of went a little bit crazy. Yeah. Did you find yourself like really enjoying that prep stage? You mentioned enjoying like the first week of rehearsal. You you like that homework. Did you find yourself prepping for an audio and think, I really enjoy this, but I'm going to, I'm going to offer this for other people. I do enjoy it. I mean, I, I am pretty nerdy with a spreadsheet and I love research. <laughs> I mean, I'm the person who is like, if you're talking and I pick up my phone, it's because I'm looking something up, do you know? And then I go down that rabbit hole. So I've always really enjoyed just learning more. I'm just a curious person. And so I do enjoy that. And I actually didn't really know it was a thing. I mean, I knew I would prep my own books, but I didn't know that other people had needed that as a service. And um, my coach was talking about needing a prepper and using a prepper. And I was like, um, excuse me, how does one do that? <laughs> uh, and whoever she was going to use fell through. So she offered the opportunity to me and I really enjoyed it. So yeah, it, it satisfies both parts of the brain, you know? Well, I have more prep questions coming up, um, if that's okay with you, because I'm uh, really interested. We love talking about prep on this show, um, which, mostly because I struggle with it so much. I like to take as many pieces of advice and tips as possible. <laughs> sure. Yeah, my pleasure. <laughs> um, but first, I'd love to, to know when in those early days, when first, you know, in those first few projects narrating with your books, what was the biggest challenge do you think you had to overcome with narrating audiobooks? Did you find it a smooth transition or was there something that perhaps you didn't anticipate coming from the theatre background into this whole new realm? Well, it's still a challenge and I'm still a very new narrator. I mean, I've, I've been around for a minute, but I've done far more prepping than narrating so far. Um, so I don't want to come off as some sort of expert. But for me, what 
was the challenge and is still the challenge is the networking aspect. Uh, the publishing industry, I have heard, <laughs> uh, is much more about relationships. And I definitely find that to be true about audiobooks. And of course, in the theater and film and TV and stuff, it does matter who you know. Um, but a little less <laughs> than with this. I mean, it's it's the constant reaching out to people to basically remind them that you exist. <laughs> that is a little hard for me because I hate being like, hey, look at me, look at me. Um, so that was definitely a challenge. I mean, listen, as actors, our job interviews are super weird anyway. Just, I mean, even for auditions, right? You spend an hour getting ready and you go in there for three minutes and you're finished. So this is just a little added, hi, psst, remember me element that gets added. And I, I find that challenging sometimes. Oh, definitely. I don't. I I really do feel that that is shared with a lot of us. Um, with that networking, do you like when you, your approach to networking? Do you, with that being a little bit more challenging, do you like you know take steps to okay? I'm going to go to this event. I'm going to be. I'm going to set out this specific time to be uh, more engaged online and you know on social circles online. Like, how do you look at that now? I do. I mean, Clubhouse has been a great opportunity for so many of us, right? To just kind of hang out, get to know other narrators. Sometimes there are producers that are interviewed and you get to learn about people that way, which is nice. And there's there are also some Zoom opportunities like Pana has webinars with producers and, and things like that. And I am in a coaching program that sometimes has opportunities like that. I When I started this, I was in Dallas, Texas, so there were fewer opportunities for actual social gatherings. I mean, the APA does online socials and things like that. And now that everybody's starting to come back and do in-person things, there are more in-person opportunities. And I'm in California now, so I will be able to hopefully have access to a little bit more of that. And I'll do the big things like, you know, APAC, which you also did this year. Um, and things like that. Yeah. But I mean, primarily getting referred by people or introducing yourself or just, you know, kind of reaching out to say, hey, if you like what you hear, give me a call. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, oh, definitely. But the clubhouse stuff has been really extraordinary, I think. And the professional, the audiobook narrators association has been great to just providing some opportunities to actually get to know producers better. So you're not just blindly casting a net, you know, it's like, oh, I really like what this person has to say. And we have this in common so we can connect on a personal level rather than just be like, hi, please give me a job. You know? <laughs> yeah, I think that's it. I think that what I always try and remind myself, because I often do find myself getting incredibly nervous in those situations is like the more nervous you are, and the more like kind of official that you make it, the sort of less, um, you know, the, the less it sort of, you know, it goes well. It, it doesn't, it, the, the more it hinders, I should say, um, that opportunity. Whereas if if you're just having a, a conversation human to human, um, I have interest in this, you have interest in that, and we're just chatting and communing. I think that's a lot, you know, not only is it more beneficial for the networking, but I think it's also a better experience for both parties. A hundred percent. I mean, I cannot even imagine how much these people are approached yeah. <laughs> or reached out to or how many emails they get every day, you know, and I, I don't love talking about myself. I mean, I think I had somebody, a teacher at some point say there are two kinds of actors, those who like to be looked at and those who don't. And I am definitely the latter. Um, so, you know, whenever I can take a friend, I'll do that and talk about the friend or I mean I just have learned to get out of myself by asking other people to talk about themselves and a lot of the time they like that <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, yeah definitely I really resonate with that um when prepping for clients when doing you know either manuscript prep or, or audiobook prep or you do um all the variations what is your routine when setting down when starting a prep a book do you do it all in one go are you working a little bit throughout the the week for example like could you take us through a little bit of a an oversight of what your routine looks like when prepping sure i mean obviously it depends on scheduling and who needs what 
when and how much advance notice you have and what kind of job it is. So there's a, a lot of variables that way. If it's a straight pronunciation research job, I might actually run it through Positron first to, to have some help picking up these unusual words. And then as I'm reading it, if I find more, I'll add to it. Um, when it's fiction, I tend to try and do it in the first read, um, in the beginning. And when I'm prepping for myself, maybe I'll read it first and then go back and prep. Uh, when I'm prepping for other people, I tend to just do it all of a piece. It's easier for me to keep track. So I'll just read through a chapter and then go back and summarize it and then move on to the next one. And anytime there's a character detail or a vocal quality or whatever that is, I'll pull that out and list it. Uh, so just as a general note for fiction, I will do chapter summaries, character descriptions. Um, I will pull out unusual words or hard to pronounce words or like if it's totally fiction and the character names and places are made up, I'll have a list of that. Sometimes I'll get some help from the producer or the author or even the narrator um, up front. And other times I'll just say, hey, this is my best guess. Please confirm with whoever's in charge of making decisions. Um, and I mean, a couple of times I've given like visual pictures if something is really heavily described and I think, oh, that's a lovely image. I'll look for a picture of it. It just depends on how much time there is. But I try to work up a flow by just doing it as I go. I find that to be the most beneficial for me. Um, other people I have heard read it first and then go back and really tuck in. I can't help myself when prepping the the project you know my my narration projects and it's like if i'm if i'm going through it for the first time i can't help but highlight i can't help but make notes um and i must admit it's not, i'm not as fond as that of that process as perhaps i should be um, <laughs> <laughs> do you have any any sort of tips to make it a little bit more of an enjoyable process perhaps for people who are sharing my point of view i do find doing it the first time through is helpful for me because I'm not as familiar and so I might not skip. Like if I read it straight through once and then go back, I'm like, well, I already know things. And if I'm prepping for my own work and I know that it's lodged in my memory or whatever, and I don't necessarily need to write it down, then I'll keep going. Um, but when I'm prepping for other people, I just, I, I don't know. I think what's the most helpful for me is to just turn on the curiosity part of my brain. Um, and just get really interested in who these characters are, what the connection is to each other. Uh, another thing that I have found helpful, I got from Andy Arndt, and she says that when she does it, she'll, she, or if she asks somebody to help her, she wants one sentence for every chapter about why is this chapter in the book. So that might be helpful to just kind of switch your perspective a little bit um, if you have a hard time gathering details if you at least know why the why this chapter is here why it's necessary what it does to build the story or whatever that is that might help i think what might make it difficult for some people is if they're just in this singular mindset like this is how i read a book and if you can just throw a little tweak in there to just open up your curiosity a little bit i think that is helpful Oh yeah, definitely. I, yeah, that makes sense. I love that idea of, I love the idea of just switching your mindset to things because I think it. I mean, because you you can apply that to so many things in in life. You know, not just, just not just the industry. And I think that it just it's so. I don't know. It's comforting to know that we have control over how we feel towards. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, like if I'm highlighting dialogue, because I will color code the dialogue per character, and I will try to really. You know, it's those theater games. If you were a color, what color would you be? I try to make it somehow related to that character. So if they're a little bit sad, then I'll give like a sort of gloomy blue for their lines or whatever, just little things like that. Or I'll ask myself, okay, archetypally, what archetypes fit this person? Are they a mother? Are they a judge? Are they a goddess? Are they, a, you know what I mean? Just anything to kind of skew it a little bit to perk up my brain yeah 
I think that's great. Do you, um, after working on, you know, with stories in varying capacities, over time, has it raised the bar for you for what makes a good story? Has it like, has it changed the way that you consume, you know, as a as a reader, just in general, working on on so many? That's a really good question. I'm not sure it's an easy one to answer. I think it definitely has refined my palate, like my te- my taste level. I can, I I when I'm reading this way, and I like something, I probably like it more than I might, or I'll remember it longer. It will stay with me more. Um, and it's cool, especially if I if I get to work on a series to see the evolution across the different books or the different characters' points of view and things like that. Um, I mean, sometimes it's what's really cool when you're reading this way is when you get surprised because you're so into the text and you're so like, oh, I bet I know what's coming. And then something happens, like I literally will talk to my computer when I'm reading uh, or whatever. So that's always always really fun. And, you know, there are certain structures and tropes that are used a lot in writing. And so it's probably taught me more about structure than anything else. Do you know what I mean? Oh, yeah, definitely. I think, yeah, it's, I mean, also working with lots of different narrators, do you find that an interesting, you know, you mentioned always having that curiosity turned on. Do you find that to be quite a enjoyable part of it is seeing other narrators processes how they work the things that they look for and then maybe finding things that you can you know adapt into your own narration life sometimes yeah it's difficult because what i do happens so much before what they do happens typically i mean that's the whole point of a prepper right is to set somebody else up uh, to do what they do so i will get it sometimes when i go and listen back and sometimes I can hear the prep and sometimes I can just really hear the narration. And it's it's interesting because it's different for every project, just like every story is different or every um, every book is different. It's, it's a really interesting question. And I think because too, there are, there are some narrators that I work with often and I prep for them, generally speaking. And so I can see like the kind of journey within the relationship if that makes sense i get more of an opportunity to to look at or listen for the kind of things that you're talking about and a lot of other times it's just one and done like they just need help for this one thing or they just need help looking up danish pronunciation or (laughs) or whatever do you know so it, it really depends and i think that a lot of what i do when i prep for publishers um is to help the director actually I mean, I think the narrators get something out of it, but I think that it's helpful for the director to kind of have a map because it, I mean, prep typically is part of the director's process. Uh, And so that's really cool when I get to kind of listen back and hear, oh, this is interesting. That's how that played out or whatever. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. You mentioned a few um, questions ago that you weren't that comfortable always, you know, talking about yourself. You, you're not that into that kind of thing, which makes me appreciate you being on this <laughs> podcast way more, by the way. Um, but you are award nominated and award winning, um, which is incredible. Um, but I just wondered, like, how are you with reviews, with checking in on how people are perceiving your performances? Like, are you one to keep checking in on how books are being received when you've narrated them? Do you, you know, with that, is that sort of something that you keep tabs on? I would say in the beginning, like the very first full length project I did, I certainly looked because I was curious. I mean, it was my first time. I wanted to know if what I thought about it was what listeners thought about it. And that's a slippery slope, my friends. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's it's dangerous. <laughs> I mean, the other day, actually, I can't remember what I was looking for. And I accidentally found some Facebook post that gave me a scathing review. And that was rather jarring, especially because I hadn't been looking for it, I think. Um, so I learned early on that it's, it's a danger zone. I try to stay out of it. You know, and I actually, I mean, like the two earphones awards that my books have (laughs) won, I had to be told by other people because I just had no idea. I I try to stay away from that because I'm susceptible, you know, 
I'll really get it in there. And then once it's in my head, I can't get it out. So I, I trust people who love me. If I'm really curious about something, I'll ask them to look and give me what they think will be constructive or helpful or just the nice things, depending on the kind of day I'm having. Um, but generally speaking, I try to kind of stay away from it. And it's, it's easier than you would think because you do the work, you move on to other work, and then the book comes out, do you know? So there's a little bit of space, which is different from being in the theater and having an opening night and then having a review come out and then having three more weeks to do it or whatever. <laughs> Um, so it's a little bit easier in this part of the industry, I think, to kind of cool it with, with re looking at those reviews. Yeah, definitely. I think it's smart because I think some of them, as well, because obviously they're just people's opinions and they also contradict other reviews on the same book, um, which isn't always, isn't always helpful. Um, the worst, worst thing that happened to me with reviews was I had a lady email me. Um, so she must have Googled, found my website, emailed, oh, geez. used yeah. my contact form and emailed me. And she was annoyed because of a particular direction one of the characters took in the pre in the last of the series. Oh, it was like, dear. I have nothing to do with that. I didn't <laughs> like... write it, ma'am. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I will read audio file, do you know, over Audible or uh, I don't like library journal, like something like that, which mostly exists for the listener or the reader to judge whether they might want to try something. The, I mean, Audible reviews are crazy <laughs> and they're so different. And the, and you'll see how, okay, this is the kind of person who reviews everything they listen to because they want to be helpful, or this is the kind of person who really wants some sort of online presence and this is how they're choosing to do it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so. I, it's just dangerous for me. <laughs> no, I'm with you on that one. But I Do can't you, believe um, she sought you out. That's nuts. I know it was. It felt like a little bit of an invasion of privacy. Yeah. Really. Although it wasn't because it was. I mean, to be fair, if you're going to contact me, the contact form on your website is probably the way to go about it. Sure. Um. So I can't really complain too much. It was just a little bit jarring. Um. And it happened like three years ago, and I'm still not over it. That's how. <laughs> so, that's how sensitive I am to that. <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. This like this accidental Facebook comment is just <laughs> sitting right here in this part of my brain. Who knows how long it'll pay the rent? Yeah, exactly. Do you um? This is a bit of a broad question. Do you have any favorite genres to work on? Do you have any genres in particular that perhaps you enjoy? You know, in your own time, or when a book comes out, say, you know, if you get offered a book, or you get a get an audition for something, and you think, oh, this this is gonna be this is gonna be right up my street. Something that surprised me when I started doing this, I think, is how much I love middle grade fiction, especially middle grade fantasy. I mean, listen, everyone is a fan of the Harry Potters and, you know, the Madeline Langles and that kind of stuff. But I, I prepped a book called Osmo and the Eight Penny Woods by Catherine M. Valente which I re recommend to every, I mean, at the time I was like, this is the greatest book I've ever read. <laughs> and I was doing it because there was, it's fantasy and there were other worldly characters. And I just was doing it for character help for uh, the narrator who's Heath Miller, go listen to it. It's great. Um, and it just, I don't know if it's something about the 11 year old in me that missed out that is now like getting fed by that kind of story. Um, but I think right now that's my favorite. And I always love, um, whether it's listening or narrating or prepping or whatever, I love like a good historical fiction. Just if there's, I always say, if there's corsets and dialects, I'm in heaven. And if you throw in a dragon, it's even better. You know what I mean? But I really, I just love good writing. I mean, I've been doing prep on a couple of light novel series that have been turned into anime like they're um, from Japanese authors. And it's not something I would ever have picked up by myself. I wouldn't probably have even watched the anime, but I'm like attached to them now, do you know? Cause it's just a series of things. So I just, good writing, I think really is the biggest turn on in any area that I'm working in, whether it's narration or prepping or directing. Yeah, 
Definitely, definitely. I love it as well when you get you you're working on a project that you would have just completely ignored had it been in your own time, and then it turns yeah. out to be like your favorite, the favorite thing that you've read this year or ever. You know, I love yeah. that when it happens. Me too. And there's, I mean, listen, being a prepper is so cool because I get to learn so much. I mean, I get to read these great fiction books, but when I have these nonfiction projects, it's like, I, <laughs> I don't know how. But two separate times I've been given books to prep slash direct about poop. Okay. Uh, you can cut this if you'd like, <laughs> but it's just like, never would I pick those up, right? <laughs> but it's fascinating. Like you just learn so much when you're asked to do research for something. And I love that. I love that. <laughs> I just uh, love yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. Do you, are you good at retaining information? Um, would like once once you've read something, are you are you sort of is that with you now? You're gonna you're gonna be able to pop that out at cocktail parties. I'd say maybe seventy five percent, and it depends on like what the subject is, how much of an interest I had before, or how much reading that changed my interest in something. I think is helpful to retain it. But there's a part of me that really enjoys being a smarty pants know it all, so <laughs> I'll tuck those things away. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Fair enough. Or we'll be working on a, um, I have a audio drama that I'm a part of and people like it happened last night. We were recording and they're like, how do you pronounce this? I was like, well, actually, <laughs> and I'm able to know it. So that's kind of great. And it's also like, you know, when you learn a new word, you start hearing it everywhere. It, yeah. There's a bit of yeah. that kind of syndrome that happens too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's really funny that you mentioned your um, audio drama, Midnight Burger podcast, um, produced That's by it. yourself and Joe Fisher, I believe. Yes. Um, as well as, you know, playing characters in the show. Can you tell us more about this project, how it how it came about, how you got involved uh, and just your overall experience of, uh, of being involved in it? Oh, my gosh. Thank you so much for asking. I love it so much. Um, it like many other things was born of the pandemic. Joe Fisher, who is my partner, and he's the creator and writer. Um, he was getting a little bit of cabin fever, I think. And so he was looking for a, a project to do that would kind of help with sanity. You know, yeah. like, I think it hit a lot of us, right? And so he gathered um, me and some other friends that he in another life had been a playwright. So he had met a lot of people through the producing of his plays. And we did a shorter project called Omega Station, which I just, I think it was three episodes. Uh, and we just did that um, kind of for fun. And, you know, he had a friend that pr put it in his feed. And it, we had such a good time with it that we decided to do something more long-term. And so Joe came up, I mean, I don't know. He's just a crazy genius. <laughs> uh, so it's kind of difficult, difficult to explain what it is, but it's a sci-fi, it's comedy. It's basically about this time traveling, dimension spanning diner that shows up at a different place in the multiverse every day at six o'clock to see what happens. And early on, it's like there's either a situation where somebody somewhere needs help or something somewhere is trying to kill them. And they just kind of navigate that. Uh, but we're in our third season and it's just getting better and more fun um, but it, that's how it started we just wanted to play with our friends and give ourselves something to do you know and then strangers started listening to it it's the weirdest thing that is so fantastic how how are you with like you know the producing side of things do you like being involved in the you know obviously we know you you enjoy the preparation of things um sure. does that carry on with the preparation you know of you know creatively looking over scripts that kind of thing do you enjoy that side of it yeah yeah i do i mean i i love collaboration in all kinds of ways um and joe Fisher, the creator, as I said, like he does the majority of the heavy lifting. So anything that I can do to help him out <laughs> and just give him another set of eyes or ears or whatever, I, I really enjoy being able to help in that way. And it's also cool to make something. Do you know what I mean? I mean, I'm used to making things with my hands, like I can knit a blanket and then at the end of it, you have a blanket. So at the end of this, we have a podcast and, you know, people listen to it. 
It was really cool. Uh, what I'll make sure to do is uh, post the link in the description, uh, the show notes of, the, of this podcast, um, so folks can check it out um, ASAP. Thank um, you. Thank you. <laughs> what's, a, what's a typical day in the life for you on a typical working day? How do you how do you structure all of your, you know, your projects, your, your different services? What does a typical day look like for you? Well, I think the beauty of this whole business and of doing a few different pieces of it is that there is not I mean, I tried desperately for a very long time to get out of my nine to five structure, <laughs> right? Um not because I didn't like other people telling me what to do or setting my hours or going to an office or whatever. It just didn't feed me. Uh, and so I'm lucky enough to be able to kind of set things up in a way that f I find fulfilling. Um, and it depends on what other people want. I mean, like last month, the prep schedule was bananas. And I basically was prepping all the time. And because I work from home, it can be difficult to separate when you start and stop working from when you do other things. Um, and I had a couple of last minute jobs that got slammed in there. And so sometimes I'm just in here prepping for massive amounts of time. And then this month, it's cool that there's been a little bit more of a directing focus. Um, and then within that, I have done a little bit of narrating. I would prefer probably to get some more narrating in there too, because it's what I like doing the most. Um, but I, I love the variety of being able to do this prep job and then this directing job and then narrate this kid's book. And then, you know, um, I probably start working around nine or 10, depending on the day. And I try, I have to remind myself to take breaks. So I'm not just sitting down all day long. That's probably the hardest part, especially if I'm really getting into something that I'm reading or whatever. Um, and then I'll stop to you know, have dinner and then kind of unwind with Joe and remember there's other things to do outside the booth. <laughs> but I'm still I'm still trying to navigate and learn the balance. And it's different every month because the projects are different. Yeah. I was going to ask, coming from a, a you know a nine to five structure, um, I, I don't know what you did before, so I don't know if it was a leave it at the office kind of thing. It may not be. So I do apologize if, if that wasn't, you know, if that's the case. Um, mm. But like, how do you find it typically will balance moving into this more freelance when you're totally in charge of your own time. Do you find, because I think that the, occasionally people can say, oh, I couldn't work from home because I would never get anything done. Like yeah. I hear that quite a lot. Whereas I'm always very passionate to say, no, it's the opposite. Mm -hmm. It's you are never not doing something because you just get consumed with it. You've got to pay those bills. It's the yeah. stress of it. I need a project. I need something coming up. I need, I, need, I haven't got, I've got nothing for August. I need something for August. Yes, you yes. Know. Like, how are you with managing that? What I did before, I worked in um, higher education. So I was an administrative coordinator at a university. Um, but my temperament and just the way I am as a worker is I don't really leave it at the office. <laughs> so, and that's, you know, probably something that I need to learn to manage better. And I have, I have definitely made some changes in that regard. Um, I think what helped me, I, I, I have been an actor for, Ever. I mean, 30 years, basically, right? Um, but I also have been very nervous about paying the bills and food and shelter and, you know, um, not getting stuck, worried about the lights being turned off and whatever. So I have had that survival sort of job that whole time. This is the first time that I really have transferred to this freelance sort of lifestyle. And I think what helped me to do it, uh, there's a couple of things. The first thing is that there was a big period of overlap. So I started prepping for sure in 2021, maybe at the end of 2020. It's hard to remember. And I just left my job, my nine to five survival job this year. So there was a period of overlap where all of that income coming in was separate. I was able to just use it to put into the career or put into the bank 
And I know that that's a luxury that not a lot of people have. If I didn't have that, I think I would be much more nervous right now <laughs> than I actually am, do you know? Um, but it's a big change going from having a steady salary, regular health insurance, all of those things. Even if you don't enjoy the work, having that kind of consistency is helpful and nice. So I guess the second thing that helped me is that I, as I said earlier, I moved to California and I moved in with my boyfriend. And so I'm not responsible for every single bill that is paid. So I get a little cushion that way, which again is a luxury that not a lot of people have. But I think the only way that I'm not completely freaking out all of the time now is that I just front loaded it a little bit, if that makes okay. sense. Yeah. And because of that, I am able to know that I have one or two months covered so that I don't have to freak out right now about July. I can freak out right now about September, if that makes sense. Do you know what I mean? And it depends. I mean, like this week I was thinking, wow, I really haven't had as much prep work as I have in the past. And is that going to be problematic? What's nice about it, too, is that most invoices are 30 days. So by the time I submit an invoice, a month goes by and I'm like, oh, no, what am I going to do? And I'm like, oh, yeah, there's that that's getting paid. So it's a whole, it's, it's an adjustment and it takes getting used to. And I realize that I sit from a privileged place in being able to give you the answers that I just gave and that not everybody's got that. And I don't expect to continue to be able to front load everything. Do you mm. know? So I think it'll yeah. probably catch up with me. But I think that's another reason why I've sort of diversified. Right. And I don't have everything in the narration basket and I don't have everything in the director basket and I don't have everything in the prep basket. That's that's my insurance policy, I guess, <laughs> is having these little buckets to dip into. Yeah, I think it's a very smart insurance policy also. Um, when when not working, uh, when not in the booth, what could we what can we most often find you up to? I love to look at television. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, one reason I love to do this is because I think we're made for stories, right? So in some form or another, I want to just indulge myself in stories. Um, I have very grandmotherly hobbies. <laughs> I like to knit a lot. Um, and it gives me something to do while I'm watching all of the television so that I feel that I'm being productive. I had a little, little business selling the handmade things i make i think i've oh cool taken it out of the booth now but little stuffed animals and baby blankets mostly and things like that that i enjoy and i i'm now in sunny southern california so i hope to be able to enjoy a bit more nature than when i was in texas where it's 100 degrees for like eight straight months yeah, it's pretty tough. I'm going to um, Fort Worth, Dallas area yeah. um, in August. And all I've been told is, wow, you're brave. And like, you're obviously, really, I've, yeah. never, I've never experienced heat like that. So like in my little mind, in my British silly mind, I was there thinking, well, it can't be that bad. But then the <laughs> amount of people messaging going, oh, no, you really need to like sort of uh, prepare for that. Um, I'm starting to get a little worried. <laughs> I mean, you're not wrong to do so. I just, I mean, I was in Dallas before I came here. And it, I mean, there are times you walk outside and you're wearing jeans and you feel like your legs are actually on fire because it is so hot and it's so dry. Yeah. Um, but the nice thing about Texas is there's central air everywhere you go. Mm. So that may be a little different yeah. than you're used to. So it's just the periods in between buildings or in between, yeah. you know, the house and the car or whatever, that yeah. it's hotter than it should ever be. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be a, an experience, that's for sure. Um, where's the where's the best place for people to keep up with you? I am, I mean, I've got a website, which is finleystevenson.com, and it's F-I-N-L-A-Y. I'm on Instagram at your pal Finley. I'm on Twitter at Finley Stevenson, I think. It's been a minute since I've been on Twitter for reasons. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> You know, I think that's that's it. My yeah. my contact information is on my website, so if anybody's looking to get a hold of me, they can find that. Except, don't send me your reviewer <laughs> stalker, please. <laughs> <laughs> that's fair. Well, um, uh, I'd love to 
end the show by simply asking if you have any upcoming projects that you're excited about and, and that we can look forward to. Right now, what I've got on the schedule is mostly directing. Um, mm-hmm. So it's kind of behind the scenes. There is a book that I'm so grateful and lucky to work on, and it is called He, She, They. It's by Skylar Baylor, who is a trans masculine swimmer um, and does a lot of public speaking and activism. And uh, it's just a lovely sort of instructional resource for, you know, how to be an ally and a better human, you know? Um, And so I'm excited about that. That is coming out later this year, I think from Hachette, um, and I'm about to start my first directing job for a Penguin Random House, which is very exciting. Very nice. The Sham. Um, and I, you know, just got some dates finalized, so I still have to tuck into that script and yeah. and look into it. I have a little children's book called Rabbit, Rabbit, Duck, and Big Bear, which is coming out, I think, July 4th, and that's what's next for me. And then just always Midnight Burger is ongoing, and yeah. it's a good time. It's a good time. Well, that just about brings us to a close for this episode of the Audiobook Club. Um, all of the links to uh, social media, website, projects uh, mentioned will be linked in the show notes. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in. And of course, another thank you to Finlay for joining us. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I appreciate your patience. I know it took us a while to get here. So I had a great time. Thanks. It was worth it. <laughs> Frustrated by the royalty rates for your audiobook? Annoyed that when the digital distributors say 70% royalties, they actually mean 70% of 50% or 80% of 70%, neither of which is an actual 70%. Wishing there was a way to cut out the middleman? Yet, you want your audiobook listeners to have a smooth and positive experience, and a direct download sale from your website won't deliver that. We at Pro Audio Voices hear you. Out of our commitment to our author clients, we've created Amplify, a program that provides an actual 65% of the sales price that you set, that gives you access to your customers' names and emails so you can reconnect with them, and keeps you in the driver's seat. Check it out at ProAudioVoices.com. You'll find Amplify in the marketing menu.